Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Our text for today is found in verses 20 through 26. Let's read through our text, beginning at verse 20. Jesus prayed, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With these words, we come to the final section of Christ's high priestly prayer that he prayed the night before the cross. It is impossible to overstate the value of these words because they reveal the very heart of Jesus for believers and his deep desire for them. It also provides us with a much needed clarity on what matters most, helping us to avoid dangerous and destructive pitfalls. What I mean is that this section of Christ's prayer can be simply summarized into two requests. First, that all believers would be one, that they would be united in the same way that the Father and the Son are united. And secondly, that all believers would be with Jesus where He is to see His glory. These are his requests that we're going to spend our time looking at today because keeping them in our minds and in our hearts simplifies our lives of faith. As J.C. Ryle said, happy is that Christian who cares for nothing so much as to be loving like his master while he lives and a companion of his master when he dies. Our life of faith is a life of divine love experienced and divine love expressed in the hope of being with Christ for eternity and seeing His glory. Now that's where we're going. And so let's begin where Jesus begins. In verse 20, Jesus begins this section of His prayer by saying, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. With these words, Jesus transitions from praying for the small band of disciples that remained with him before he died, those who would become the apostles of the church, to then praying for all believers of all time. And this in itself is a great comfort to us today because it means that any believer at any time in history can, can point to these words and say, Jesus has prayed for me because I am among those who have believed through the witness of the disciples. Which, by the way, always has been and always will be the means through which people come to believe. For the original testimony of the apostles of Jesus Christ 
is that proclamation upon which the church was founded and established. It's the word of truth preserved for all times in the pages of the New Testament which the church has proclaimed and declared from then until now. It is the word of the apostles, God's word to us through them. The word of the disciples, which they had received from Christ and from the Holy Spirit, is the means by which people come to faith. Just as the Apostle Paul declared in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, which says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So in the first verse of our text, Jesus tells us who he's praying for, and he's praying for us. The night before he died, he was praying for you and for me, for all who would believe. We were on his heart that night, and we were in his prayer unto the Father. That should encourage us. Next, Jesus makes his first request for all believers in verses 21 through 23, when he prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them as you have loved me. Being a believer is more than simply coming to know about God in Christ. It is coming to experience God in Christ through His Word. And that experience is described here as believers being in God, united to Him through faith. This so elevates the believer's relationship with with the Word and with God's truth. Because it's not like the relationship between a student and his textbooks, merely becoming acquainted with a subject and acquiring a new set of skills. For the believer's relationship with the Word brings them into a living relationship and experience with God through faith. It is a supernatural experience. It is not an achievement, such as when a person earns a degree through, through long and careful study. It is a gift supernaturally given to those who desire to know God and who seek Him in Christ through His Word. And the result of this new and supernatural relationship with God is a new and supernatural relationship with other believers. For all who are united to God in Christ through faith are also united to one another in Him. For if each individual believer is made one with God when they come to Christ, then each individual believer then becomes united with all of those who are one with God. It's inseparable. They go together. And so Christian unity then is an essential part of our salvation experience then. And therefore, we need to treat it as an important subject of the faith and an important pursuit in our lives. The very fact that it is Jesus' final request to the Father should convince us that it is, in fact, important this along with the reasons that Jesus then gives for asking the Father for this unity among believers. Such as in verse 21 when he prays that they may all be one so that the world may believe that you sent me. And then again in verse 23 he prays that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. The unity of believers is a witness to the world about the truthfulness of Christ 
and about the love of the Father for those who are in Christ. Often when we think of evangelism and our witness to the world, when we think of reaching the lost for Christ, we, we leave out a very important part. Because it's not only the message of the gospel that we proclaim. It's the reality of that message in our lives demonstrated in the unity and the love that's shared among believers. It testifies to the reality that the Father sent His Son and has loved believers. Warren Wearsby put it well when he said, that the lost world cannot see God, but they can see Christians. And what they see in us is what they will believe about God. If they see love and unity, they will believe that God is love. If they see hatred and division, they will reject the message. So you see, our witness to the world is not just a matter of the message that we declare with our lips about God, but it's also the reality of that message that we are to demonstrate in our lives, in our relationships with other believers. That is what the world can see. This is not a matter of organizational unity. Jesus isn't praying here that the world would, would, that the church rather would be only, would have only one denomination that every believer would be a part of. He's not praying either for the uniformity of all believers so that we all just look the same and dress the same and talk the same and cut our hair the same and, and share all the same opinions and preferences and convictions about everything so that there's one standard culture for believers. Throughout the history of the church, men and women of God have come to different convictions and opinions about many different subjects from different cultures and walks of life. They've belonged to different denominations with different practices of worship. But those who sincerely love the Lord Jesus Christ, those who desire to know God in Christ and, and that He would be made known in the world, those who have come to experience God in Christ through the gospel, knowing that there's no other way to God than through His Son, they share what matters most and are therefore united. They love the same God. They trust the same Savior. They share and are indwelt by the same Spirit. And the same divine love has been shed abroad in their hearts. And where that is present, there is true unity, even across denominational lines and cultural differences and practices of worship. There's unity. R. Kent Hughes asks us to suppose for a moment that we could bring some of the great Christians of the centuries together under one roof. From the 4th century, we would come to the great intellect of Augustine of Hippo. From the 10th century, Bernard of Clairvaux. From the 16th century, the peerless reformer John Calvin. From the 17th century would come John Wesley, the great Methodist advocate of free will, along with him, George Whitfield, the evangelist. From the 19th century, the Baptist, C.H. Spurgeon, and D.L. Moody. And finally, from the 20th century, Billy Graham. If we gathered all these men under one steeple, we would be unable to get a unanimous vote on many things. But underneath it all would be unity amidst a great diversity of style and opinion. Hughes goes on to explain that too many think other believers should be just like them, carry the same Bible, read the same books, 
promote the same styles and educate their children all in the same way, have the same likes and the same dislikes. That would be uniformity, not unity. Christians are not called to be clones. In fact, the insistence that others be just like us is one of the most disunifying forces in the church. It engenders a judgmental inflexibility that hurls people away from the church with deadly force. One of the gospel's glories is that it hallows our individuality, even while bringing us into true unity. Now, of course, none of this is to, meant to suggest unity at all costs, as though truth didn't really matter. This unity is found only in experiencing God in Christ through the original witness and word of the apostles, the New Testament word. It's unity in the gospel. It's unity in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. It's unity in the central and essential truths of the Christian faith. That the one true God has revealed Himself to us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has not only made God known, but has redeemed a fallen people through His sinless life and through His sacrificial death on the cross. This is not a unity with a false gospel. It is not a unity with false religion. It's a unity with all who have been united to God in Christ by faith through the word of truth. But wherever that is present, there's a lot of room for differences of opinion. There's a lot of room for differences of practice. And we must be so careful not to make our opinions and our practices a standard by which others are judged in their relationship with God. Therefore, as J.C. Ryle admonishes, let us bear much, concede much, and put up with much before we plunge into secessions and separations they are movements in which there is often much false fire. Hence, that simple word of advice of his that I mentioned at the beginning. Happy is the Christian who cares for nothing so much as to be loving like his master while he lives and a companion of his master when he dies. There's a lot of division in the church. I mean, that's no secret at all. There's a lot of infighting and quarreling in Christendom. And there's no way that you and I could change everything that's broken and divided in the worldwide church. But we can do something. We can focus on our own relationships within the body of Christ with other believers and not just within the four walls of our church. We can focus on doing our part that Jesus' prayer would be fulfilled in us, that the love we've received from Him would then be demonstrated as a witness to the world. We can seek to be more accepting and more welcoming of other believers based on their relationship with Christ and not based on how closely they align with our preferences and practices. The unity of believers is not based on our shared opinions. It's based on our shared interest with Jesus Christ. If we forget that, if we forget that our unity is a witness to the world, if we forget that our unity is a means by which the world may come to believe that the Father sent Jesus into the world, and a means by which the world can know that those who believe in Christ are loved by the Father even as the Father loves the Son. If we neglect that, then we can end up proclaiming the gospel from our lips while contradicting it in our lives through our relationships with other believers. 
carrying on the disunity that is so often seen in the world. And if that's the case, then we shouldn't be surprised when the world doesn't believe our message because we're sending them conflicting messages. So while we do well to believe God's message of love for us in Christ, we mustn't forget that this love is meant to be an experience demonstrated in our lives. When a person comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that love is to then be demonstrated as a witness to the world through true Christian unity. It's something supernatural in our lives that, that can only be explained by God. And so while we are quick to remember the message of God's love for us and how God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life, we're right to remember that. But may we not forget that the demonstration of this love must be present in our lives and how love is patient and kind. How love doesn't envy or boast. How it's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And it never ends. This is God's will for our lives as believers in our relationships with each other. And it makes the church a picture, a glimpse of heaven, a foretaste of, of things to come. Therefore, it is not an unimportant subject, but is an essential part of our witness Lastly, let's consider the second request of Christ in this prayer. The one that he makes in verses 24 through 26 when he prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you, and these know that you've sent me. I made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Incredible words. Jesus desires all believers, you and I today. He desires us to be with Him where He is. He wants that for us. He wants us to see His, His eternal glory because this is the highest and most exhilarating and most satisfying experience in the universe. Not merely going to heaven but seeing the unveiled glory and majesty of Christ. Charles Spurgeon pointed out how Jesus didn't say that he wished for his people to be in heaven, but to be with him in heaven, because that makes heaven heaven. It's the very pith and marrow of heaven to be with Christ. Heaven without Christ would be an empty place. It would lose its happiness. It would be a harp without strings, and where would be the music? It would be a sea without water. That which makes heaven, heaven is Christ and seeing His glory. That which brought a taste of heaven into our world was when Christ set aside His unveiled glory as God and dwelt among us revealing the Father to us, giving us His very self. He gave His life for us in order that God could indwell His people and so that they could dwell in God. 
And so that the love with which the Father has eternally loved the Son could be ours. The infinite love with which the Father has eternally loved His Son. You need to see something here. That salvation is so much bigger than we're used to thinking of it. It's not merely having your sins forgiven, being rescued from hell. It's not merely going to heaven when you die. It's being brought into the eternal glory of God and being made a partaker of the eternal love of the Trinity. Jesus made the Father's name known and will continue to make it known so that eternal love would be in us. And if that's not displayed in our midst, then something's wrong. Jesus not only revealed God's glory, but he gives it to us by coming to dwell in our hearts. God in us, God with us. By uniting us to himself so that we're actually his body. And by making us in God. So God in us and us in God. He makes us fit to dwell in heaven where we will see him as he is. And we're told that when we see him as he is, we will be made like him. It's the hope of the believer. This is the hope that we're called to live in, joyfully awaiting the day when we see him. And in the meantime, from then, from now until then, we're called to be better reflections of that love with which he's loved us and which we have come to share in. Our lives are a witness for Christ. And they're all saying something. It's not a matter of whether you're a witness. Is what's it saying? Either you are demonstrating the supernatural unity and love for which Jesus prayed here, or you're contradicting it. Christian unity is far more important than we usually give it credit for. And Jesus knows that it's a struggle. He knew what would take place throughout the centuries. The struggle that it would be for us. And so he prayed to his Father that we would be united so that the world would believe that he came from God and so that the world would know that believers are loved by him. May this prayer be answered in us, making our lives a compelling witness to the Savior's love. Let's pray.